Good morning again. It's hard to believe I'm in my 17th year here at Calvary. And as I look back at that time, I see all the different ways in which people dealt with Christmas, the changes that I have seen. For example, when I first came here, one of the biggest issues was you no longer would see they were fighting in the courts and fighting everywhere. They wanted the nativity scenes removed from all public buildings. They wanted it replaced with Santa Claus and the menorah. And after a while, we found that that's exactly what happened. And the reason they complained about it, and many people complained about it, because they thought that it was establishing some form of religion as Christianity as a religion. So they didn't want anything that would smack of an endorsement of religion. I can tell you too, when I was growing up, things were very, very different. Did you ever go to the mall when you were growing up? Of course, we're, we're not kids here. The kids just left. But we, we used to go to the mall. When you went to the mall, what was the music you heard in the mall? All sacred hymns. There were some jingle bells, but predominantly you would hear sacred hymns. Now when you go to a mall, what do you hear? Santa Claus is coming to town, and no longer do you hear those sacred hymns. Things have changed. But I noticed that the biggest thing that has changed, and some of you that are younger, there is a thing called a mall where you used to go shopping. You don't just go on Amazon and order things. There was a place where you would go to, and it was called a mall. Now, changes all over. But, and one of the biggest changes that we have seen that evangelicals would oftentimes react very strongly to the secularization of Christmas. We did not like that. We were very vocal about that. We continue to be vocal about that. And you find it also on some of the news channels speaking in regard to that. But what is, in my humble opinion, which is much worse than secularization of Christmas is the sentimentalization of Christmas. Every time you hear about Christmas, it's this beautiful, humble story, how wonderful it is, how great it was. It really isn't the picture that you show in the Bible that the scripture speaks about. It has no historicity whatsoever in what scripture says. Now, everything is about sentiment. Be sentimental against. I'm, I'm not against, personally, against sen being sentimental about Christmas. I'm not saying that. But when it distorts the truth of what Scripture says, we need to be very, very careful about that. So, this morning, I would like for us to look into God's Word and examine God's Word and to see exactly what was the context in which our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, entered into this world. He came as a baby, humble. We know that. But he also came at a time when the world was in a dark time, as Scripture would say. It was very dark time. The people of God who lived especially in Israel and surrounding Israel were under occupation by the Roman Empire. They no longer were free. It had been many years since David's time when they had some authority, where they had some freedom, where they were able to worship God. Now they lived under Roman rule. They were suppressed. Also in Israel that you would find, which is very similar to our times, there was great deal of political unrest within the people of God. For example, there were two groups of people. They're called the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees would be more of the liberal group, let's say. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in miracles. They were a group, 
that were generally looked at as liberal. The other group was the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, they were what we would call legalists, or the conservatives, let's say. And they were at war with each other. The Pharisees believed in legalism, following the law, and they reminded people to keep the law. Not only did they talk about the law from the Old Testament, they wrote about the law of the law so that they would even expand on the law that was written. Two very, two different political groups fighting within the believing community, let's say. Now, when we look at our text this morning, and we're looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, it's a very familiar text to you and a very familiar text to me. Let us hear God's word as we read that. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped them in cloths and placed them in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. God, may we hear your word. In Jesus' name. Now, Luke is an historian. He wants to give you the context of what happened, how it happened. Luke starts out and he tells us, in those days, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now, where's the angel? Up until now, the angel appeared to Joseph, the angel appeared to Mary, told him everything, no angel. Now we find that Caesar, Augustus, is now making a decree that the people of God have to go back to where they were born to register. And the reason why they had to go back, you know why? Nothing new under the sun. For taxation purposes. To tax the people. They had to get a good record of where everyone was. Now make it, let's be clear. Luke goes into great detail about that. Now, this dimension of the narrative makes it quite different from all the myths and all the fables of that time, especially in the Greek world, because those gods, those statues that you see, never came to earth and lived among the people, were never human. They were, in their case, not even superhuman. They were just fables. So we're surrounded in that time. Now comes the story about God himself being born in real history, in real time. But what the historical time context tells us is that during that time, a decree went out. And remember, at that time, even though it wasn't the people of God would not have to go back to their cities, but the Roman Empire required people to go back for taxation purposes in order to get an accurate reading. Now, who was in charge? Caesar Augustus, the august one, the one who is a deity figure, one who is majestic, one who is wonderful. Now, Augustus reigned from 30 B.C. to 14 A.D., and he took the title named Caesar Augustus. Now, he was probably the greatest ruler the Romans ever had. Under his time, 
there were more building programs than any other time. It was said when Augustus came in, Rome was brick. But when he left, it was marble. He had building programs everywhere. And in those building programs, keep in mind, are where the roads came. And those roads were the very same roads that our Lord and Savior and the apostles walked down to spread the gospel throughout the world. Augustus also set up massive systems of centralized government. He regulated commerce and trade throughout the area. He strengthened the military, the Roman military, not just in that region, but throughout the whole Roman Empire, the military became stronger and stronger. And it was a time when Rome was at peace. Pax Romana. Peace in Rome. He, before Jesus Christ came, he was the greatest leader known and also the one who was called a deity. He was distinguished by everyone as the greatest statesman of the time. One of the most fascinating studies in theological circles has to do with the word time. Now the word time has a number of different meanings in the Greek. For example, in one translation in the Greek is chronos. Now chronos has to do in our English language, which has have came over, a, a chronometer, another word, a watch, and a chronology, a sequence of events. The chronicle, the Calvary Chronicle we have. Some word chronicle was usually used for newspapers. It refers to a normal passage of time. Now, other words translated as time is karyos. It refers to a single significant time, a significant time in history that had great significance. In English, it would be what, what we're doing right now, and this is the best way, it's historical. We're gathering together. It's history, it's historical. When something significant happens, it's called historic. In other words, it changed everything. Life has changed. So in that time, in the Old Testament, that word would be used often for historic things, like the day of creation, the time when they were delivered from Egypt out of slavery, the law when the law came down from Sinai, the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those were times that were historic, that changed the world, changed everything. Not just historical, like we're doing, but historic. The New Testament would refer in a different word, a Greek word, talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, that word would often be referred to as the fullness of time. Now, the fullness of time, the best way to illustrate that, this Greek word meant, is if you had a glass of water here, I should have brought it, and you filled the glass of water to the brim, and then put more water in where the water began to overflow the glass, that would be the fullness of time. When Jesus Christ came, it was the fullness of time. Things were perfect for his coming. Everything that happened up until this moment was all about his story coming. Jesus the Christ coming. Now, remember, who is in charge at this time? Caesar Augustus. And what happened with Caesar, he was so popular, so effective as a leader, that he became a deity figure. And they know now they began to call him Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. And it became mandatory that the people would address him 
and talk about him as Lord and God. That caused a tremendous amount of unrest among the people of God because the people of God would not submit to that. And here, at this time, is when Christ comes back. Things could not be darker politically, religiously, and also in the land wherever they were. They were oppressed people. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born unto a woman. And here Caesar, Augustus, has this taxation program that is required. And the people had to go back to their place of origin. So it was that Joseph and Mary, Joseph wanting to go back to Bethlehem. Now Bethlehem was originally called the city of war. Only one letter changed it, the city of bread, which it is known by today and it was known at that time. Only one Hebrew letter changed it. It was no longer city of war, but city of bread. But notice, the only reason historically that this happened, an angel didn't send Joseph and Mary to go back to Bethlehem. How did it happen? This august leader, the Caesar of the whole world, was like a puppet in the hands of God. God used him to fulfill the prophecy that was found in Micah. God was working even in these leaders. He was in charge, he was sovereign, he was providential, and he was moving this leader to do what? To fulfill the prophecy that the Savior would come. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. It said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. If an angel had sent Joseph back to Bethlehem, no one would have ever known that's where the Messiah was coming from. It was from Caesar who made an edict that they should go back to their place of origin and there we find that Jesus Christ is born. Caesar becomes a pawn in the hands of the mighty God. Now the picture that we see historically here, which Luke goes to great ends throughout his letters to show, is that at that time, things were very, very dark. Extremely dark. For example, why we get the example with the light. Jesus came as the light of the world because he was entering into the darkness. And the light would illuminate the world. He would come as a savior. Politically, there was enmity between groups all over. People were impoverished. People were suffering. It was a dark time. Now the picture, not to make it a sentimental picture like we see everywhere we go, remember, Joseph and Mary traveled roughly 80 to 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. 80 and 90 miles. She was nine months pregnant. Kimberly, how would you have done just recently with that? And we don't know how exactly they traveled, whether it was on a donkey or not, but they traveled 80 or 90 miles. It shows a picture of God's people suffering. It shows a picture of God's people struggling to believe. Struggling to say, God, I know you said this will happen, but this isn't how I expected it to happen, God. 
I didn't expect to have to go through all of this. Now, many people look at Scripture, and if you look at the pictures of Christmas, as if they were like, oh, this is fine, I'll go 90 miles, it's not an issue for me. <laughs> and we like to put up all these beautiful, sentimental pictures, but it was rough. It was rough for the people of God. It was rough for Mary and Joseph, just like it's rough for you and me to believe and follow Jesus Christ, to walk in his ways, to believe him. It's not an easy thing. You need faith to do that. Jesus came in a very similar situation as ours. There appears to be darkness everywhere. There appears to be a people who no longer love and follow God. The people have all gone their own way, as Scripture tells us. And it is into that world that Jesus Christ comes as a baby in humility. It is in that world that He comes to us. The message of Christmas is that Jesus is the light of the world, the light of your world, the light of my world into the darkness of politics, into the spiritual darkness that we find everywhere, and the personal darkness that we ourselves often find ourselves walking through. This morning, the message of Christmas is first of all that God is in charge. God is sovereign over all. He moves even the leaders of the world to do his bidding in order that his purposes, his promises will come together. Jesus Christ came into this world to redeem and save the lost. He came into this world to redeem you and to redeem me and to make us whole. So at this Christmas season, may we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, but in reality, there's no picture in Scripture that any of this was easy. Even after the Savior was born, immediately after that, there was struggles and there was doubt. Now, I'm not encouraging you to doubt. I'm encouraging you just as Mary and Joseph had to do, is to persevere, is to believe and remember you were children of the great king. I was reminded as a, it was about 14 and a half years ago, I had to take a journey to China to pick up Matthew. I didn't, I don't like flying that much. When I was young, I was a macho guy. It was nothing for me. Then all of a sudden, one day, I go on the plane. It's like, you know, you know, I get cupata in an Italian way, but you get, you know, I didn't like to be, I get claustrophobic. So I'm flying there, and it's 14, I don't know how many hours it was there, but I remember how many hours it was coming home. It was over 33 hours to come home from China. Now, my wife's a wonderful lady. She didn't complain once. Right? But you can be sure. Me sitting in my air-conditioned plane with the air blowing right on me, I was murmuring. I think of that because I think about how Mary, where the child of the king, the king of kings and lord of lords, is born in a stable, and she has to make room for cows. She has to make room for her child to be clean and safe. It was not an easy journey. The picture of Christmas is that Christ came for you. And all that would receive him, he bids you to come. Come unto me. All you will labor and heavy laden, for I will give you rest. One of the commands Jesus gives often is 
Come. Come. Come to Jesus. Come to Christ. Come to our Redeemer. And let us be reminded that He is a God that will never leave us, never forsake us, and He's a God that came into the real world where you live and where I live. And He most certainly understands. Praise His name. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the new life we have in you. We thank you for your mercies that are new to us each day. We pray and ask God as we finish our worship service this morning that you would send us home full of the grace of God. That it would be said of each one of us as it was said of Christ that we are full of grace. Grace to our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our families, wherever you place us. Full of the grace of God, which has been bestowed upon us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.